All right. How many of you uh, don't know my story? Raise your hand. I just needed to see that. Okay. I want to read a passage from Scripture. I've asked them to put them up. I use the NIV, and I understand that this is going to be the New King James Version. It's very similar. Mine's right. That one's wrong. So, <laughs> you know, the good thing about a translation is it's taken from the original language, Greek or in the Old Testament, Hebrew or Aramaic in some cases, and it's a translation. So, it's, you know, when you have a translation, it's not accurate to the original language. I mean, you have to choose a word to reflect the thought or, 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 and so, you know, if you look at these versions that we have, the NIV or the King James, they're similar, but, but people had to make choices. How many of you make choices in your life every day? How many of you made a bad choice this morning? You know, in life, full of choices, and sometimes they're good and sometimes they're bad. And when we make wrong choices, isn't it nice to have a God who's gracious and loving that can forgive us in the midst of our wrong choices? Let me read this passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. You know, what this literally says is that when, when we're going through something, when we're going through some trouble in our life, some difficulty, some suffering, what this implies is that God is setting you up for a ministry. You go through something so you can minister to people on the other side going through similar stuff. It gives you a, an experience. It gives you a, a way through it so you have an expertise now so you can minister to somebody going through trouble. How many of you volunteer for trouble? None of us volunteer for trouble, do we? You say, no, of course not. But God's grace is what? Sufficient. So when you go through something, listen, you will never be tested beyond the capacity of your faith to deal with it. God may stretch you to a point where you think you're going to break, but listen, the promise of the word is that God will never stretch you beyond the capacity of your faith to deal with it. He loves you too much to break you. He may stretch you to a point where you think you're going to break, but here's the good news. You won't break. His grace is sufficient. He will sustain you. I'm glad you had this lovely choir over here. I've been to, I've been to Kampala, Uganda. I was talking, I prayed for them earlier today and, and I know a pastor, uh, Jackson Sinyanga, I've spoken in his church and all of you guys know Pastor Sinyanga and you know, I'm so blessed that you're being blessed. You know, that you have a covering and, and a protection and over your life. Not just from your heavenly father, but through a living presence of parents in your life, of parent figures in your life that can model for you what it means to, uh, to grow up in the Lord and to know Jesus Christ and the love of the father, the heavenly father. And this morning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to all of us about that father's love because it's important to understand it. But for those of you that don't know my story, I just want to show you a short video. I had a stroke. 13 years ago, I was paralyzed. I was talking to 200 businessmen, had a cerebral hemorrhage. Uh, I went to the hospital. I was walked, left out in a, in a wheelchair and a brace on my leg. I was done. I was 57 years old. The doctor said, you're going to wear this brace. You're going to be a cripple the rest of your life. Now, that was some trouble I didn't want in my life. Believe me, I would have never volunteered for that. But God had to take me through something so he could use me in on the other side to do what I'm doing now. So just bear with us. If you've seen this video, um, you know, bear with it. For those of you that haven't seen it, I want you to see the story because I don't want to go back there. I talked a little bit about it last night. Uh, and, and if you, how many of you know Michael Koulianos? You know, you'll see Michael, who I didn't know at the time, catching my wife in this video, my ex-Southern Baptist wife. That was an experience for her on that and for me. But watch this, and I will uh, share a few thoughts about it and then talk to you about the Father's love. On May 7, 2004, Reverend Paul Teske was speaking at a men's Bible study, never realizing that what was about to happen would change his life forever. So I stood up and began to talk, and about two minutes, three minutes into my talk, 
My entire left side from my waist down was completely gone. I mean, when I said gone, it was like a light switch went off and I was completely paralyzed. And I'm standing there, no headache, no backache, no pain, and I'm thinking, what is this, a, a, a pinched nerve, or is it a, did my leg go to sleep? But I kept speaking because I didn't have any headache, and as I'm talking, I'm standing on my right leg, and I'm thinking, uh, this is so surreal, maybe it's gonna go away. As he began to uh, walk towards his chair, um, I noticed, including a lot of other people, that all of a sudden he collapsed. He couldn't bear his weight on his legs, and uh, he just fell down. Paul was rushed to the hospital to find out that he had had a stroke. The doctor's report stated, left leg paralysis secondary to a right vertex hemorrhage. Two weeks later, Paul was released from the hospital with a brace and a walker and began an outpatient therapy program that was to last several months. Well, when I'm in the hospital and I, and I saw that Benny Hinn was going to be in Baltimore, which is only maybe three and a half hours away, four hours away, when I, when I when knew that God was going to heal me and I knew that that lady in my church had been there in August of 03 and was healed, that that was the venue that, I, I mean, it wasn't by coincidence he was in Baltimore on the 21st day after my stroke. Uh, so I just, I just knew that that was the venue I should go to. Just one week after being released from the hospital, Paul and his wife, Rivers, went to the Benny Hinn Crusade in Baltimore, expecting a healing. The minute that the music started, uh, I knew that something was about to happen. I, I felt it. Um, I know that Paul felt it. During the second worship set, I started to vibrate. It was like a jackhammer. I can't explain it, but I just started shaking. And Rivers said, what's going on? I said, I, I believe God's healing me. I, I really think God's healing me. Quickly, you, you, can, yeah, come, 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 come. On the platform, fast, come on. The Lord is gonna use both of you, are you ready? You're so ready. Touch in Jesus' name. Touch in Jesus' mighty name. Uh, three weeks ago today, I was speaking to 200 Christian businessmen at the New Canaan Society. And about two minutes into my talk, I had a stroke. My God. I had a hemorrhage in the brain and a loft, uh, my, my left leg went paralyzed. And I finished my 30 minute talk because I thought my, uh, I don't know why, I just had the strength to do it. They took me to the hospital and I was supposed to get out today. I got out last week. So I, I know Bruce and Lisa Hughes, so I called them up and I said, Benny Hinn is too close for us not to come down, but uh, God has just restored me, and uh, it's, it truly is a miracle. God's grace. Stretch your hands towards him, that this Sunday miracles will happen in that church. We believe that as the gospel will be preached out of this man's lips and his wife's, that they'll see mighty signs and wonders as in the book of Acts that that church will experience such a flow and an overflow and an abundant flow of the spirit that ezekiel 47 will be fulfilled in that congregation when well, now only their feet are touching the water but soon that glorious water of life will flow so great and so deep it will draw thousands into that congregation lord i pray healing ministry will be granted to this couple who've served you for years Give them that mental. Touch! Dear God. Dear God. Two weeks later, Paul went back to the doctor. The report stated he has had no setbacks in his recovery and no current symptoms. In Paul's case, Hallelujah, I want to say hallelujah. It was all God. There was no, no problem left you know, in, in his left leg. Miracles did happen that Sunday morning at St. Paul Lutheran Church and have continued with intensity for the last two years. Paul and Rivers received a healing ministry and they are seeing lives changed wherever they go. Jesus Christ healed me, but Benny Hinn was the conduit through which the power of God flowed in that meeting. If people say, would you go to a Benny Hinn crusade? Or would you recommend it? Absolutely. Even if you don't need healing, just go for the worship. Go for the praise. Just go for the, 
experience of being in the presence of God. It's an awesome thing. Jesus is the healer today. He's never changed from uh, the past, the present, and the future. He will never change. And that is the expectancy that we equip with and that we believe in our own hearts. So that's kind of a nutshell of the story. You know, it's kind of funny when you see me standing in front of Benny Hand there, I, I couldn't walk two feet without that walker or wheelchair. And, and I instantly get healed in that meeting during worship. Nobody prayed for me, laid hands on me or touched me. I was healed in worship. I, when I walked up there, he didn't know I'd been healed of anything. He just felt led by the Lord to call us up to tell us we were going to have a healing ministry. So for the last 13 years, you know, we've been to 60 countries on six continents. I've been to Africa 15 times, India numerous times, China. I mean, 60 countries is no small thing. And our primary purpose, I'm still a senior pastor in a church in Westport. I've been there 28 years. I've got a school and a church and 29 of my staff, but I travel about 120 days a year because I, I, I get invited to Daystar and God TV and TBN, CBN, James Rowe, all these shows. And so people see me and they want me to come. And as a Lutheran, I'm an enigma to the Pentecostals because I'm doing their stuff. And I'm an enigma to the mainline because I'm doing the Pentecostal stuff. But God has used us in a, in a mighty way. And so I, I wrote a book called Healing for Today. It was published in 2010. It got translated into Korean. Uh, it's out there. If you, if you, it tells the whole story. And I really wrote it as a manual to help people understand healing and what it's about and how to move in it. Uh, how many of you know who Benny Hinn is? How many of you don't like Benny Hinn? <laughs> My mother didn't like him. She's passed away now, but she didn't like Benny Hinn. I say, Mom, why don't you like Benny Hinn? I don't like his hair. <laughs> you know, I don't like his clothes. You know, I don't like his theatrics. And I said, well... <laughs> That's where I got healed. I said, listen, if God can use donkeys to speak for him, if he could send Judas out with the 12 to raise the dead, kick out demons, and heal people. Did you know that? You know Judas went out and did that stuff? You know who Judas is, right? Iscariot? Jesus sent him out to heal, kick out demons, raise the dead. Did you know that? If he could use donkeys or, or Judas, he can use Benny Hinn, me, or any of you. Believe me. He chooses the vessel he wants. And, and listen, there's no perfect vessel. Amen? We're all broken. But we're the best God's got. And some of us are flawed, more flawed than others. But that's all right. The grace of God washes away a multitude of sins. And you ought to be thankful for that, as I am. I am. You know, healing's a powerful ministry. It drains you emotionally. When you see people uh, come up and, and leave and, and you see the, the burden, children that they're living with, it takes something out of you. You know, and we think of healing as a physical aspect, but it's, it's more than physical. Uh, it's psychological. There are people that are living in fear or with anxiety that need to be healed from that. God wants to give them peace to, re, to take the stress away. Some people are so burdened they can't sleep at night. God wants to heal that. The fear that flushes, uh, the, the perfect love of God that flushes away that fear. You know, that's, a, that's a, a healing. There are people with broken hearts. You know, somebody tread on their heart, broke that heart, and they'll never, never trust again. Do you know anybody like that? Maybe you're like that. You know, God wants to heal your heart. He, he doesn't want you to live with, with the inability to trust. That's why Jesus says in the case of adultery, uh, you know, you can get divorced. Why? Because you can't be in a relationship with someone if you can't trust them. It will drive you crazy. Amen? Amen. God wants to heal the broken hearts. It's, I think sometimes it's harder to pray for a broken heart than a broken leg. Yeah. It's so embedded in that pain. And there's also relational healings. I mean, there are, there are, there's a need for relationships to be healed, not just marriages, but relationships between parents and their children, between uh, grandparents and parents, between neighbors and colleagues at work. I mean, relational healing is important to God, and he can heal relationships. And, and of course, the most important healing of all is what? A spiritual healing. You know, we're all born in this world sinful. By nature, we are sinful. And that sin is is. In us, it manifests itself. There's a little passage in Genesis that freaks people out. But it says children are from the imaginations of their heart are evil from youth. What does that mean? It means that kids will start thinking up stuff 
You don't have to teach them how to lie. They will cover their, their tracks, won't they? It reminds me of a story. There was a dad. He was told to babysit his five-year-old son and, their, and his colleagues, his little buddy colleagues. There's like five or six little five-year-old boys. How many of you know what that's like? <laughs> so the dad's looking at these boys, and he says, all right, kids, look, here's the backyard. It's safe. It's fenced in. There's some tough. Do anything you want to. Just don't pee on this bush. Anything you want, no pee on this bush. They're all sitting there going, okay. He looks out the window three minutes later, guess what they're all doing? <laughs> you don't think kids can't think up stuff to do? You know, look, it's, it's part of our sinful nature. And that's why Jesus came, to redeem us from that nature. You know, sin is not just what we think and, and what we say and what we do. It's, it's our nature that needs to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So healing is important. And I want to share a passage from Mark 16 because last night we had about 300 people here. We had a great healing meeting. And I want you this morning, to, I'm not going to reiterate that. I'm, I'm going somewhere else this morning for your sake. But I want to talk about the power that God gives us in his son, Jesus Christ. And it gets encapsulated in these last two verses of Mark chapter 16, the, the, the last two verses of the gospel of Mark. It says, after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. What's significant about that? Jesus was, was exalted and put back in his rightful place at the right hand of the Father. And listen, all authority, all authority was given to him over all creation. So every disease, every marriage, every job, every, every financial bind, Every demon, everything is under the authority of, of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's just the fact. He rules this universe. His feet are on this earth. He has all power and authority, and he gives it to us, church, to use in his name. I, I have no authority, but Christ has authority that he gives us, church, and he gives us the ability to use his name. If you're an ambassador, a friend of mine was just recently offered the ambassadorship to Canada under this new president. And he turned it down, not because of Canada, but he had some other things that, that he was, and he had family and so on. So he, he took another position in, in, in the White House. But he knew that as an ambassador, he would represent the president and have all the authority behind him, that when he spoke, he was speaking for the man he represented. Church, we speak for the man we represent. His name is Jesus Christ. We have equal authority that Jesus had. And what happens with that authority? It says, then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them to confirm the message with what? Signs, wonders, and miracles. So everywhere the church went, book of Acts, preached the gospel, taught the love of the Father, the message was confirmed with what? Power, signs, wonders, and miracles. That hasn't changed. That's still the church today. It just too often doesn't know how to exercise the authority and the power that's been entrusted to us. We're to be good stewards of this. And we're to exercise that authority and that power that Jesus has given us. A church without power is a church that's weak. A church without power is a church that's deficient. But when you begin to move in the power of the church, the name of Jesus Christ over his body, stuff happens. Last night, stuff happened. At that healing meeting, stuff happened. I got healed 13 years ago because of the authority and the power of Jesus Christ came down and touched me. Listen, that's an incredible power. And the Holy Spirit in you and me raised Jesus from the dead. If you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit. The Bible says no one believes in Jesus Christ yet by what? The Holy Spirit. You're a temple of the what? Holy Spirit. That's the same Spirit that raised the Jesus from the dead. How much power is that? It's like you're a little Volkswagen with a Porsche engine in you. But you've never hit the pedal. Listen, hit the pedal. You've got the power of God. Start laying your hands on You know what's interesting in this chapter 16? It doesn't say pastors will do this. Deacons will do this. Elders will do this. It says believers will do this. Read the chapter and believers will go out. If you're a believer, you have that capacity in you because you have the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Now, this morning I want to talk about an emotional healing. 
I want to talk about an emotional healing because I think this subject impacts all of us. I want to talk about the Father's blessing. The Father's blessing. I've been married for 41 years. I have three grown children. I have three wonderful grandchildren. And I have laid my hands on, on all of them and blessed them with a Father's blessing. I've told them and continue to tell them repeatedly that I love them, that I'm proud of them. I hug them. I kiss on them. I'm physically attached to them because I want them to know that they are beloved of God and they are beloved of me, their father. How, how important is that? It's, it's absolutely mandatory that people know that they're loved. You know, it's interesting. In Proverbs 17, 6, it says, Children's children, that's grandchildren, are the crown of old men, and the glory of children is their father. You know, children are our legacy, and our grandchildren are an extension of that legacy. You know, when we have children, not everybody has children, I understand that, but children, we're all, we all had parents, or we wouldn't be here, right? That's right. We all had parents, and we are legacies of them, and we have legacies, and we can, that's the only thing that we're leaving behind, in a sense, is the legacy of our children. And they need to be beloved, and they need to know uh, that love of the Father. All right, mothers give birth, and that's the hard part for sure. My wife and I went through Lamaze. You know, I helped her blow. I didn't get a medal for that. <laughs> but listen, dads are the spiritual and physical covering for their children. Fathers are the spiritual and natural covering. They are the protection and the provision for the family. And you need to understand that, dads. You are the covering, you are the provider, and you are to protect. That's a very important role. Even the secular world gets this. I'm going to throw a quote at you from Sigmund Freud, who said this, I cannot think of any need in childhood as strong as the need for a father's protection. He understood that dads have to cover their children, men and women, boys and girls. It's not just exclusive of one. Now listen, together, mothers and dads cultivate a child's purpose. They cultivate his purpose. They help set a plan in front. And they help create and carve out a pathway. You can't let a kid do this in a vacuum. You have to take responsibility for their life. You have to help them say, look, you've got a purpose. And it has to be a design around their giftedness and their talents. You can't shape them in what you think they ought to be. You've got to let them grow up and be who they are in a sense. All right? And then that plan, you help them craft a plan for their life. And then you help them with the pathway. You help them prepare the way because sooner or later that they're going to fly out of that nest, right? And they're going to be on their own. And that's an important role at home, parents, that we help them in these areas of their life. What's the purpose? What's the plan? And what's the pathway? It reminds me of Coleridge. Remember him, the poet Coleridge? He was having a, a debate one time with a friend of his about whether or not to let kids kind of craft their own future or to help guide them. And he was talking about spiritual future. He was talking about growing up in the church or not. And his friend was saying, look, let them choose their own religion as they grow up. Let them, let them take care of business. And Coleridge would say, that's a mistake. You can't do that. If you put them in a vacuum, they're going to maybe make the wrong choices. And so after going nowhere in this debate, they go outside and Coleridge looks over and there's an area of his yard that's overgrown with weeds. Did anybody have a yard like that? And he says, how do you like my garden? <laughs> how do you like my garden? And his friend said, that's no garden. That's, that's a weed patch. That's a weed patch. And Coleridge said, no, that's my garden. I just kind of let it develop the way it wanted to. <laughs> let me tell you what, if you don't help your kids find their purpose, their plan, and the pathway, that's where they will end up. You have a responsibility. And dads, it's not just to sow seeds, but it's to cultivate that's not the mom's responsibility. It's a collective responsibility. Now, listen, dads play an important role. Mothers want to keep the nest full. Moms have a difficult time letting kids go. How many of you know that? 
Dads have a responsibility to cut the apron strings, right? You are responsible, dads, to help launch your kids, the boys and the girls, into adulthood. They have to leave the nest at some point. We've got a whole generation of millennials, millennials that aren't leaving the nest till they're about 30. But that's okay. Jesus didn't leave the nest till he was 30. That's what it says in Luke. He, when he was about 30, he started his ministry. And all the millennials are going, all right, I'm going to stay home another <laughs> seven, eight years. Now, Jesus started his ministry, but he didn't start it without a blessing from his father. He goes to the Jordan River. He's baptized by his cousin, Andrew. That was a test. Okay. You passed it. Howard said, John. I said, okay. Yeah. And what did the voice from heaven say? He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You know what's significant about that? The father in heaven blessed his son, said, I'm proud of you and let him begin his ministry. Jesus did not start his ministry till he had his father's blessing. That was a real and valid blessing. And, and how many of you know that the ministry of Jesus was blessed? See, he wouldn't start it till it was the right time and the blessing had come. Now, let me, let me talk to you about a fake blessing. Oh, I guess we're in Canada, I'll, I'll say faux blessing. Oh, you don't speak on this? Okay, a fake blessing. How many of you remember the story of Jacob and Esau? Remember that? You know, from about Genesis 27 to 33, you've got these verses, these, these chapters about this, uh, this narrative. And, and Jacob was a mama's boy. How many of you know that? You know, he was Rebecca's favorite. He was a twin. His brother's name was Esau. Esau was the oldest born a little bit, you know, a few minutes earlier. So as a uh, custom, he was the inheritor of his father's estate. The older son got the estate. The rest of the kids were dependent on the older brother, all right? But Rebecca had another plan. She didn't want Esau to get the estate. She wanted her favorite, Jacob, to get the estate. So she dresses Jacob up like Esau put some woolly stuff on him because evidently Esau was a hairy kid and Esau goes out to hunt to prepare a meal so he can get the father's blessing. And Rebecca sends Jacob in to see the dad, Isaac. And Isaac now has lost his eyesight or he's feeble. He can't see very well. He feels around, he feels Jacob, thinks it's Esau, gives him the blessing. But how many of you know that was not a real blessing, see? He stole the blessing from his brother. He stole the blessing. Look, you need a, a valid blessing in your life from the right person or it's not going to work. The brother comes home and he's needless to say upset. And he tells his brother, when the old man dies, you're dead. <laughs> That's what he says. You're dead. There's no brotherly love here. You stole my birthright. In fact, he goes to his dad, and the dad gets upset because he realizes he's done the wrong son. And Esau is pleading with him, can you, take, can you give me? And he says, look, son, once a word's spoken, you can't get it back. I blessed your brother. I can't retrieve it. And Esau said, give me a blessing. He says, I can't. I can't. Let me tell you, that's, there's a message in that for you too. When you speak a word, dads and moms, you can't retrieve it. And those words sometimes can be like hammers and sometimes they can be soothing. You can't retrieve a word. It's like an arrow. When you shoot an arrow, and you can't get it back and it will land somewhere. And you have to be careful about what you say to your children because you can be extremely destructive. You know, you may be in a bad place in your life, a bad mood. I don't care. Words are powerful and can't be retrieved. And so Jacob runs away. He runs to his uncle's Laban's place and he hides out for 20 years. 20 years. He gets married to an older sister and then he gets married to the love of his life. And then finally, after he's massed all kinds of possessions, he's a wealthy man. Say wealthy. Wealthy man. He's a wealthy man. But he has to go back. 
And as he's going back, he's thinking about his brother Esau. <laughs> he says, this guy, I hope he's still not angry. I hope he still didn't want to kill me. He's now starting to worry and fret about this brother. And eventually they come to the Jordan River, and he's about to cross over the next day to find his brother Esau. And so what does he do? Being the great man of God he is, he sends his wife, his children, his possessions, everything on the other side of the river. In case his brother shows up, he's got a buffer to protect him. Think about it. That was a pretty cowardly thing to do. And so he's by himself on that side of the river, and he has an encounter with God. He has an encounter with God. And if you read the story, he wrestles with God all night long. And he says to him, I'm not going to let you go till you get me, give me what? A blessing. Why would he say that? Because for his entire life, he knew that the blessing he had received from his earthly father was a fake blessing, a false blessing. It didn't validate him as a, as a person or as a man. And he said, I am not going to let go of you until you bless me. And God says, it's going to cost you something. He said, I don't care what it costs me. I'm going to get the blessing. And God said, it's going to cost you your hip. And he said, take it. I don't care. Because he knew that life without a father's blessing is useless. And so he gets the father's blessing. God takes his hip out of joint and he limps the rest of his life, but he had the father's blessing. And when he meets Jacob, I mean uh, Esau, he says to Esau, look, read it in verse 11, I think chapter 33. He says, I want to give you back your blessing. And Esau says, you don't know, I don't want it. You don't need to do it. He says, you know, you got to take the blessing. It's yours anyway. And it says at the end of that verse that Esau took the blessing back. You know why Jacob could do that? Because he knew that he lived a lie his entire life. He lived this lie his entire life, and finally he gets validated by his heavenly father, and he's now man enough to release this fake blessing back to its rightful owner. Listen, what's the message? Friends, you and I need to have a valid blessing from our earthly father because that earthly father is the filter through which you're going to see your heavenly father. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. As you see and experience your earthly father while growing up, that's how you're going to see and experience your heavenly father. And if your father's not been a stellar player, it's going to be a barrier for you to receive the blessing from your heavenly father. Think about Adam and Eve. How many of you know who they were? Adam and Eve. They had it pretty easy, didn't they? Garden of Eden, didn't have to work, could eat from any tree except one. Didn't have to work, didn't have to toil, didn't have to do anything. It was all handed to them on a silver platter. How many of you'd like to have life like that? Come on, be honest. Come on. Throw me in the Downton top upstairs, Downton Abbey. Here I am. Well, throw me. That's where they were living. And what happened? They, they ate from that one tree. I like to look at it this way. It's like God says, Teske, I'm going to give you a million dollars. You run out, I'll give you another million. You run out, I'll give you another million. I'll give you another million for all eternity. Just don't go to Cleveland. <laughs> Adam and Eve went to Cleveland. That's, the, that's how ludicrous this is. You think that's a pretty dumb thing to do. Aren't human beings pretty dumb sometimes? They can think up some of the dumbest things. Our mind is our greatest asset, but it's our worst enemy too. You can rationalize anything and justify it in your sinful nature. And let me tell you, it may not be right. Look at the curses they received. The curses that they received, all right? Um, Genesis chapter 3, we're, we're going to look at Adam's curse first. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because you, through painful toil, will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, from dust you are, and to dust you will return. You know what this translates to in the vernacular? There's no more free lunch, son. 
You're going to have to work. You're going to have to strive. That's your curse. You are going to have to develop a career. You're going to have to master something, and you're going to have to work and toil and sweat to gain it. It was no longer going to be easy for him. And so he became a striver. He had to strive and work hard and pursue his career in order to pro provide himself and his family with what he needed. That was a curse. Instead of having the free lunch, now he's having to strive and, and work. Adam had to strive. Jacob became a striver. Jacob became a striver. Just read the account in the book of Genesis. Every day, Jacob was working and plotting and engineering himself to gain. Why? Because they both needed their father's approval. And they both were put in the penalty box. And as a result, they became strivers. Men will become strivers if they don't receive the father's blessing. A friend of mine was, uh, ran track in high school. And his father never came to one track event except his junior year. And at that junior year track event, his father shows up. He saw him in the stands. The guy was absolutely elated. He was beyond repair. His dad was there. He was going to, and he ran his best race, his best personal time. And he came in second. And he was so excited. He ran to his dad at the end of the match. And he said, dad, what'd you think? And you know what the father said? You didn't win. You didn't win? Come on. That was the last meet the dad went to. The guy went on to run in college. Father never came to a meet. He went on in business, became a millionaire, never satisfied in many aspects of his life, if you understand what I'm saying. He's chased everything to try to find gratification and satisfaction. He strove his whole life and never found any peace until he found Jesus Christ. That's another story. But he was a striver. He was set a standard that he thought that his father would accept, and he kept trying to reach that standard. And every time he got close to it, he pushed it a little higher and a little higher. Nothing he attained in his entire life brought him inner peace or satisfaction because he really was looking for his father's blessing, his father's affirmation. He said he would have loved to his dad, dad to just say, I'm proud of you, son, one time. Or even deeper than that, to say, I love you, son. One Father never said, I love you. How many of you can relate to that? The dad doesn't, doesn't say, I'm proud of you or I love you. Well, let's look at Eve's curse. Let's look at Eve's curse. I think it's interesting. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, to the woman, he said, I, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. And with painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. There are two components to this curse. The first one is the obvious, that there's going to be pain in childbirth. The second one, though, is not so obvious. The second one is this. Your desire is going to be for who? Your husband. Your desire is going to be for your husband. What does that mean? Well, think about it in this context. Here's Adam now, who is striving because he has to have a career. He has to work and toil. And who's behind him? But right behind him is his wife who's desiring him. She's chasing Adam. Adam's chasing his career, and this two are in tandem. Because she desires him, she can't catch him. He's pursuing the career, can't get his hands around it. Doesn't that sound familiar today? Men are chasing their careers and their wives are chasing them. And let me tell you what, wives, if you can't catch your husband, you'll become the man you can't catch. And that becomes a disruption to the culture. I'm not saying anything against having a career, but let me tell you what. You've got a broken scenario here from the beginning. And then who suffers in this? So often the children. Now, I'm going to bring it back to the dads. The dads are the ones that have to provide and protect and affirm their spouses, their, their wives, and their children. The children need to hear those words, I, I love you, and, and, and I'm proud of you, and I, and I bless you. 
Because without that, children are be, going to be, grow up and become strivers. The boys become strivers. The girls, let me tell you what girls will do. They will find love in all the wrong places. I tell dads all the time, you better hug your daughters because if you don't, somebody else will. They need that affirmation. They need that love. They need to know as, as a dad that you care for them. You know, our culture is so confused right now in many ways about these very issues. And, and what is the solution to break this curse? There's only one solution, and you see it in Ephesians 5. Submit one another to, submit to one another out of reverence for whom? For Christ. You know, Christ submitted to his Father, and he sets the model for us. And if we want to break the curse on our life, guys, we need to submit to the Lord and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? In regards to my family, my children, my, my wife, and women need to say, Lord, I submit to you. What do you want me to do? And listen, if you can, and if, if both the man and the woman can submit to Christ, they can submit to each other and yoke themselves in a right way and begin to understand the fullness of that relationship and why they came together and what's the calling and the purpose for them and, and what's the responsibility for their children. Otherwise, they become narcissistic self-absorbed, self-love, self-serving, and independent at the expense of those people that are depending on them. I was just in Budapest. My wife was asked to speak at the World Congress for Families. 4,000 people there, eight, 80 nations represented. And I had an interesting discussion with, with the, uh, some people in parliament in Budapest for Hungary. And they said something interesting. They said, you know, for 10 years, we had to fight com uh, the Nazis and racism. They were about superior race. And then after the World War II, uh, we were invaded by the communists. And for over 40 years, we fight communism, which was all about class, one class. And then they leave. And then for the last 30 years, we fought against liberalism who are trying to elevate individualism at our traditional family value expense. So our parliament passed some laws. We, we passed the law that we believe in the traditional family between a man and a woman. We passed the law that we will not have abortion in this country because we believe in the family and the sanctity of life. And they said for the last 30 years, the West, who are trying to impose their liberal values on us, at the expense of our traditional values, and they have said, if you don't capitulate, you're going to be kicked out of the European Union. 28 countries, four are sticking together, Poland, Slovenia, Hungary, and Romania. They said, we are not going to capitulate. We will get our membership in the EU. Isn't that sad that they fought 40 years against the East and now for 30 years they're fighting against the West. And who is the West, friends? We are the West. We need to submit to Christ and understand our role, our responsibility in relationship to our Heavenly Father. And dads, I want to tell you something. It starts with you. Because you are, again, are the filter for your kids to, heaven, to the Heavenly Father. Dads, I know, have been remiss. They have not said, I loved you. They've not said, I'm proud of you. They've not said, you're my beloved princess or prince. And you know why? Too often they haven't had that experience, that experience in their own life. They grew up in a culture where men didn't do that. No one taught them to do it. Let me tell you something. Today, you're being instructed in what you need to do. You need to tell your children you love them. You don't need to be absent from them. You can be physically absent by working a 70-hour week. They need you. You cannot retrieve that time that's precious to those children. You can be emotionally absent through alcohol or drugs or some other substance. It's setting your children up for disaster. I know some of you didn't, never knew your dad. My grandson never knew his birth father. My daughter got pregnant her freshman year in college. He wanted an abortion. She said, I don't believe in that. Two wrongs don't make a right. 
She had our grandson. He's 20 years old. We intentionally sowed into his life until my daughter met a wonderful Christian man and got married who'd adopted him. But I never wanted him to know that he was not loved, that he was not precious, that I wasn't proud of him. I stood in as a surrogate until God brought the right person because I did not want him to know or think that he was a throwaway. And some of you feel that way right now. Your father never said the things that you needed and wanted him to say. You were left in a vacuum. You know, fathers can be abusive. They can be sexually abusive. They can be verbally abusive, physically abusive, not just toward you, but toward siblings. You know, and if, you, if this is resonating in your ears as a dad, think, I want you to think about this. But if you grew up in a home where your father was not there to tell you that he loved you and, 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 and blessed you and those things, then, then it probably wounded you deeply. And, you, and, and, and if you're looking at your life and you're thinking, you know, there are things that I've done because I've, I've never known the Father's love or maybe you've found that you're striving all the time and I don't know what, what's going on, but, you know, today is a day where we can mend this and make it right. I know it's an opportunity as you listen that you can make things right. Some of you are bitter right now against your dad's. Because of some of those things I said, the abuse maybe or the absenteeism. You know, my wife, her father left when she was five years old. Her mother remarried when she was seven. And the man she remarried was, he was good financially, he was good supportive in that way, but he was an alcoholic. And so one father was physically absent. The other father was emotionally absent. And so her whole life, she grew up craving, craving that affirmation. Just to say, I love you. He never said, I love you. Till she was in her 60s. Never has said, I bless you. He was a guy that, you know, wouldn't hug or kiss. He just kind of grunt, kind of, you know. Couldn't even smile. And that just perpetuated that wound. And it became deeper and deeper and deeper until finally a healing took place. You see, if you're carrying around the bitterness and the resentment and the anger and the hatred and all that stuff, today's the day to release it. How do you release it? You forgive your father. You forgive him for not being there for you. You forgive him for the unkind things he did. You forgive him for not being there in your life. You forgive him. You release him to God. I know some of you are looking at me right now saying, but you don't know how bad, how bad it was. But let me tell you something. You're being held captive to your emotions right now. You are mostly chained up. And that bitterness and that resentment will never leave you until you release it by forgiveness and you give it to God. Say, Lord, I've given, I'm laying my dad on the altar today. I'm giving him to you. You deal with him. I'm going to be free. I'm, I'm going to be free from the emotional pain that I've experienced for whatever. And then, and then maybe, a pathway to your heavenly father will open up for the first time. You'll see God as a loving father who will never abandon you, who will never turn his back on you, who will bless you and forever. How many of you can relate to what I'm saying as a, as a, with a father that wasn't there for you? How many of you need a blessing today, a father's affirmation like Jacob got at the Jordan River so your life can go forward uh, unencumbered? How many of you need something like that? If you need it, I want you to come up this morning because I want to pray for you. 